it's such fun. It was such fun planning for this, and such fun this morning talking with with my colleagues here, <clears throat> because we love stories of what goes on in classrooms. So, so how does it work? What does it look like? What does integrate, integral education look like when it's in a classroom? And that's what we're attempting to illustrate for you. First, however, I would like to start in a little different way. In India, when most of the, the gatherings I've gone to in India, workshops I've led or attended, classes, um, certainly gather, large gatherings of children, children's assemblies in schools, always begin, often begin, with a moment of silence. And I'm going to ask that of you as well. For me, it's a way of leaving the rest of my life outside for the time being to be collected on the way out. But becoming very into this space and ready to interact with these folks. So I ask that of you. Once again, welcome. <clears throat> I would like to introduce my colleagues in a, a way that, uh, again, is oh, it's my way to introduce them. Uh, when we wrote to Devashish, we sent in a bio that has appeared, our official bio appeared in the pamphlet. But he also asked us for a statement on our feelings, our thoughts, our experiences in this field. And those are what I would like to read to you as introduction. These are what we offered at that time. Liz, Liz Steven, as an educator, parent, and grandparent, Liz is keenly interested in the challenge of appropriately educating children in a rapidly changing world and for an unknowable future. She emphasizes the need for the development of competencies such as creativity, perseverance, resilience, flexibility, imagination, independent thinking and confidence. Liz remains active in the field of teacher preparation as time permits, offering courses in schools in several states. She continues to consult with schools on a range of organizational and pedagogical topics. She is the president of the Alliance for Public Waldorf Education. Welcome, Liz. <coughs> Um, on the basis of her personal experience of being born and raised in an integral education environment and then moving on to higher education. She has struggled and then found ways to engage with that from an integral education standpoint. We're honored to hear that viewpoint today. Um, she's interested in how the community's ideals are engaged in practice, notably in the spheres of socioeconomic economy and alter development, integral yoga and education, community and international community. Welcome to you. Heidi is passionate about lifelong learning, teaching that nurtures student development along multiple lines of intelligence simultaneously, research in whole person approaches to higher education, and assessment of student learning objectives and outcomes. She aspires to assist students in understanding the value of their integral education and how to effectively communicate that to circles outside CIAS. Jean Eisler. With my professional formative years in the quote open education days of the 60s and 70s, I found Mothers and, and Sri Aurobindo's three principles of integral education to mirror my own beliefs and pedagogy before I had heard of them. Working with teacher interns, I am more focused on their knowledge of and commitment to each of their future students than on their knowledge of Dewey's Creed or improper fractions. 
I'm interested in their guiding each of their students to become a curious, energetic learner who is confident in his or her own successes. So, self-chosen projects, open-ended discussions, relevant service learning, and utilization of various learning styles all contribute to my quest. I'm heartened when I visit classrooms of alumni from this is the University of Washington Bothell Education Program and see children engaged in individual searches, community projects, and respectful disagreements. That's Gina. <clears throat> the format today, instead of each of us presenting a paper, we're going to have a conversation. <laughs> and you may listen in. We have our water, our coffee cups here. We we're going to have a chat here talking <laughs> about classrooms, integral education, what does it look like, some of the joys that we have experienced in those classrooms and in working with children. Um, the format I'm following is exactly the one in the pamphlet. Your pamphlet says that our panel will be discussing uh, integral education, how it may be understood today. You can follow along and I'll, I'll show you. This, so number one topic for us will be how it may be understood today to particularly in higher education. Three, considering different modalities of integral education. You see how I'm following the, the learning? Mm -hmm. uh, four, and the resources and conditions needed for its practice. So we'll be taking those as sections, just as a way to organize our thinking and our sequence. So therefore, here we go. How it may be understood today, integral education, how may it be understood today? Someone's going to jump in. We didn't develop a, a script here. My goodness. So uh, for me, this question of integral has been a theme through three or four decades of work in the field that as a confident young teenager I swore I would never go into, which is teaching and education. Um, be careful of what you wish for when you're young. Um, and how do, really for me it comes down to what image do we hold of a human being, no matter the age. And if we, you know, I was joking with Jean, I, uh, we, we talk about holistic education, whole child education, I've never seen a partial child, um, but I have seen children with obstacles, with blockages, um, with <clears throat> need for support. So really, it, for me, Integral has to ask then, well, what do we mean by human? Um, and a true Integral approach flows out of that, considering the not just the narrowly academic, which is often the provenance of schools, but the emotional, the social, uh, the physical, uh, and importantly, the spiritual or essential, and how can they all be worked with and addressed? Um, and once we have that picture, with one other piece I would add, on a path of development, which the teachers of course are on as well, then out of that we can start to ask questions about what we teach, when we teach it, how we teach it, because we've answered the why. So that's my sort of thumbshell of my understanding of integral. Thank you. Um, I'd like to share a quote. This is from um, A Dream by the Mother. She says, In this place, children would be able to grow and develop integrally without losing contact with their souls. Education would be given not for passing examinations or obtaining certificates and posts, but to enrich existing faculties and bring forth new ones. <laughs> so following on what you just said, Liz, um, the conception of, of the human, right? And um, I mean, what comes through really strongly in this quote and what was my experience is growing up in Orbel, um, which is founded, and I'm sure most of you here know this, but founded on the basis of integral yoga, um, is the conception, the experience, the honoring of the psychic being. And that that is the part of the child that is never, you never lose sight of that. So that the uh, education environment and the education um, continues to foster an ongoing connection and discovery 
with the psychic being, so that any learning experience um, that they might, you know, engage within serves to inform um, their self-understanding and to develop themselves in a real authentic connection with who, who they are at a soul level. Um, these sound like really, you know, big words and really lofty um, ideals. Um, but I would say that one of the things that I really experienced in shifting outside of the orbital environment and into other education environments that didn't espouse this philosophy was very much missing that dimension of the soul. And um, feeling really kind of very limited and very shriveled um, in my process, even though you know I was a brilliant student, I had all these different faculties, and yet you put me in an environment, you put a fish out of the water, you know, you put, you continue to develop these things, but outside of a connection with the psychic being, um, and it all starts to pale very, very, very quickly. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is, um, Jean mentioned about the classroom, and in terms of how we understand integral education today. Um, my personal experience from Orville, and it's not just mine, it's all of those who um, were born and raised there, or many of those share this, it's documented in qualitative research, is that actually the most formative aspect of our upbringing, of our education, happened outside of the classroom. Um, and I, that was really strongly you know, my experience. And of course we had the, um, the privilege to be in a sort of integral learning environment. So it was an institution, you know, and CIS had a much harder task. Because here you are creating the center, you know, in the midst of a, of a broader dominant society that doesn't necessarily um, espouse those ideals and doesn't necessarily understand them. Whereas us, you know, you go in and out of, you know, the school, the classroom, and there's this whole field um, in which these ideals are held and practiced and inform all the other people that you're interacting with and that serve to remind and, and uphold that, that level. Um, so yeah, that would be my little contribution is it's actually more outside of the classroom than inside of the classroom, thinking about integral education for the future. <coughs> I'm just going to say, I'm a little nervous. I feel like if I name that, maybe that'll help me let it go. Um, where is integral education at today? Um, I feel like to situate it a little bit, it's not like CIIS and Oroville are the first people to think about a more whole person approach to education. Um, Jesuit and other religious education models have had, you know, this intellect and spirit dynamic at the fore for a while. And um, in this past, you know, 20th century and now into the 21st century, there's other approaches where, you know, there's a student centeredness or there's a contemplative education. So there's ways. Um, places outside CIS are also leaning into this approach. But integral at CIS, to me, still remains uh, a one-of-a-kind educational approach and place. And this is because of like what you two have shared. Um, it's based off of the principles of integral yoga, which the founder of our institute, Dr. Chaudhry, lived and practiced. And you know, so it, in that, there's, a, there's an assumption or a belief that education, higher education, can be a venue for the evolution of consciousness. And I feel like that's where we, we still are unique um, at CIIS. Um, and, and more than just um, acknowledging the multidimensionality of the person, like we've been talking about, the physical, emotional, social aspects, spiritual or transpersonal. It's also about um, an increased awareness on interrelatedness or community levels, and it's also an increased awareness and dedication to ecological and social justice. So it's 
individual multi-dimensionality, and then it's also the multi-dimensionality that is happening all the time, whether we kind of acknowledge it or not. Yes, it, it didn't begin 50 years ago, yeah. right? Um, and, and yes, it's, uh, it's a holistic viewpoint. David Marshak has said, in the most profound way, integral education is the sibling of integral medicine, as well as what you cited. Both are formed on a holistic conception of life. Uh, it, integral education begins with the root meaning of the latter word, educare, to draw forth from within. From an integral perspective, the purpose of education is to recognize and nurture the unfoldment of the acorn of the child into the oak of maturity. And yes, this takes the whole world. This is not done in one classroom. And so oftentimes an integral education classroom will not be limited to those four walls, but will include many, many experiences outside and acknowledging the, um, the value of those things. Um, it might be integrated rather than taking separate disciplines. Okay, now put on your hat your math hat, children, put, no, put away your science books. We're going to talk only about math now. It's not integrated, it's not uh, separated into separate disciplines, but <coughs> it might be focusing on a book that the children are reading together, and they'll see that, that it'll, well, take, what, the one that came to mind was Harry Potter, um, and think about all the disciplines that you will cover when you're reading Harry Potter. Uh, certainly the mystic, but also the environmental, the social, the mathematical, the, all of those, the literacy, the historical. Um, so you'll bring those disciplines into your conversation by focusing on something that includes all of them. And all of those are integral to that one focus for the time being. So this might be one way that, that the classroom would look. It's focusing on, on, on uh, an integrated piece rather than separate disciplines. Yes? <laughs> um, I will read um, those principles that I spoke of. Uh, I refer to them up until today as mother's principles. I'm wrong. Mother uh, did value those Sri Aurobindo's principles. I should have known. Who would have known? Nothing can be taught. In other words, um, the only ex learning that we experience is just an unfolding of what we already know. This was what was meant by the uh, opening of the acorn into the tree. It's already there, and the teacher's um, purpose is to unfold that. Nothing can be taught. The mind must be consulted in its own growth. And you alluded to this, how you, the, the children come with different strengths, styles, um, abilities, and the, the greatest skill that I try to instill in my students is, a, as I said, a knowledge of and a commitment to each, each child, every one, as an individual an unfolding of how that child learns, what, ch what environment that child is coming from, how much can I learn about that child that will help me direct his or her uh, an educational path. So the mind must be consulted in its own growth. We grow from near to far. We start with what's familiar to us in order to adapt that not understanding to things that are, are beyond our ken. Knowledge unfolds in layers, much as a bud into a flower. Children are first aware, and so, and when you think about when babies and toddlers are developing, they're getting a sense for their environment, the people in their environment, the things, the foods, the climate, and then, so it, you wouldn't thrust them into a total, in the ideal world, wouldn't thrust them into a totally different environment to take them where they are and watch how they grow, how they interact with their environment. Their learning is going to come from direct interaction with their environment. Lots of 
hands-on. So those are the, those are the principles that uh, we'll be referring to later and that are pretty, pretty bedrock to the integral education idea. More things? Number two. <clears throat> so how it may be understood today, particularly in higher education, In any, okay. So I'm going to immediately display my bias. Um, full disclosure, I, I spend my, my, my day job is in this building. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm very squarely in higher education right now. And uh, interestingly, I was asked to address this question earlier in the year at a conference, Integral Approaches in Higher Education. And I keep coming back to the young child. Um, and that is partly, I think, a reflection of my, my stage of life. I have the great redemptive gift of being a grandparent. Um, and watching human unfolding with a little more distance, uh, a little different lens than either as a parent, certainly, or even as a teacher. Um, and, and yet the qualities that I think we, we can readily understand that young children need in order to have a protected space for learning and development may well have a lot to teach us in the field of higher education and I'd like to explain that. Um, direct experience of learning, even though we are at a more intellectual phase by the time we get to university. Acknowledging that we digest the world in different ways we're not all going to learn from a book or a lecture. Uh, so different modalities of learning. Environment matters. That the classroom or the university itself is a teacher and imprints itself on us just as it does on the young child. And that older students have a right to aesthetic surroundings, appropriate spaces and beauty as much as the young child in order to really develop. Um, we're part of wider systems, so nature within a higher education environment, just as for the young child. And then there are the elements that have interestingly been identified by the tech world as being essential. Play, story, breathing. Um, and the, this is not the dialogue we typically have in higher education. And even when we're talking integral, we're often talking simply about cross-subject learning. But I think there are some deeper qualities that speak to how we develop as human beings that would be very interesting to bring into a discussion about higher education. Thank you. Um, so while I had the absolute privilege of growing up in an integral learning environment, I then went to very traditional mainstream universities. I did not have the privilege of coming to CIAS <laughs> for my higher education. Um, so what I can really talk about is the contrast and what happens when you don't have integral education in a higher education environment. Uh, and I touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, so for me, you know, I mean, I grew up, as I said, as a kind of very fulfilled, I would say, balanced person growing up in the Oregon environment. And then I uh, attended a university in the UK, and my experience was that I very quickly became depressed. And, um, and for the reasons that I spoke to earlier, which are that there is no space, there is no invitation for you to be there as a whole being, uh, particularly with that soul dimension to it. Um, not to mention all kinds of other dimensions like emotional, you know, and all of these other places you mentioned play and breathing. So even even your physical body is not really welcome, you know, into that space. Yeah. Um, and I just want to like touch on the the breadth of this issue. I mean, in the UK currently, over ninety percent of university students report mental health issues. Hmm. I know this is a huge issue in the United States as well. So what I want to say is that we are literally talking about a public health issue when we do not integrate these deeper aspects of the self in these spaces. Yeah. So um, I think that it is vital that we have institutions like CIAS, and I really you know, 
thank this institution and everybody within it, who are pioneering different ways in which we can, you know, quote unquote, occupy, to use a very Bay Area term, occupy these spaces. It's incredibly critical. Um, the other thing I can say, because I'm not an educator myself, so I can only speak from personal experience, um, Jean touched a little bit when she was reading the lines that I had said about how I came to then re-articulate my own relationship to these spaces from an integral kind of perspective. And so this is very personal, but um, when I first attended university and was extremely disappointed, um, predictably I dropped out. Um, you know, for so many reasons, I was studying uh, international development. Um, given, you know, my background growing up in what was still then called a quote-unquote third world country, you know, um, and I was studying this as the leading institution, higher education institution in the world for international development. And I just found it absolutely absurd that I was sitting in between four walls, coming back to the classroom, studying India. That I had born, that I was born and raised in, and I had grown up in, you know, my whole life with people, you know, no, no issue, I mean, no um, criticism of them who had never been to India, never traveled to India, um, including sometimes my own tutors and professors. So there was that whole aspect that all I'd come from an environment in which I was learning from everything, then just to be kind of segregated <laughs> into a space, you know, which was all of a sudden so divorced from reality, you know, the kind of typical sort of ivory tower criticism that we have of higher education. And um, so I crossed off higher education, <laughs> even though, you know, my professors, everybody was saying, oh, you know, got a brilliant career, clearly in academia. And, you know, on, on my reports, on my assessment, everything was looking fantastic. But I was feeling awful and like this was absolutely irrelevant. Um, so I just want to, you know, really mark those contracts really clearly because I think it's important that we do so. And um, Coming back to the integral yoga, the only reason that I went back to higher education was based on intuition. Um, and I kind of almost dare say, um, what do you call that, Advesha? Advesha, no? um, I was fortunate enough to visit an institution here in this area and I walked in and, you know, all of a sudden I thought, oh, okay, I feel, I feel at home here. Um, and I didn't know why, and then when I got there, um, I realized that, I mean, I met, you know, so supervisors who found out where I was from, in Oroville, and who said, you should do your thesis on this. And I thought, what, how can I do a thesis in my own home? So all of a sudden I realized that there was, you know, a deeper logic to why I was in that space. Um, and then later, when I submitted the thesis, and it was really well accepted, even though people thought, oh, this is really fringe, I don't know if it's going to be accepted, and they said, oh, you should do a PhD. And my first reaction was, you know, looking up, why me, you know? <laughs> I just forced myself, or I basically just managed to get back into this room and get through my undergrad, you know, after having left it for five years, and you're picking me again to do this academic thing. So just to say that when I re-engaged, it was from a very different place. It wasn't from a place of, I'm 18, I should go to university because that's what you do. I went back to it because it's what... I felt was being asked of me. So in the spirit of karma yoga, you know, I said, okay, I will surrender to the divine will <laughs> and do this, even though it's not necessarily the most comfortable path. I, a couple of things. I think first, um, yes, the mental health problems are very real. We're dealing with suicidality with chronic stress and with very high levels of anxiety. And I just want to, I think it's fair to state that certainly CIIS is not in any way immune from that and I don't want to create that picture. Mm. And that we also have many people who I think are drawn here out of soul and spirit hunger and are then very frustrated, and I think this is a higher education dilemma, a slightly different definition than the one you gave, uh, when they come up against the, the less than ideal and what then do I do with what I'm seeking for. Mm. So I think that's a, a real high, a, a very alive higher education question right now. Um, and when the ideal bar is set high or the illusion is created, the, the encounter with less than ideal is very painful. 
So that is one, one factor, and we know that um, our rising generation of college students who aren't here yet, because we have older students, are very idealistic um, and less conventional, um, <coughs> I think, than in, in maybe in previous generations. But we're still so much in the field of higher education, I would say actually more than other, but it, it drives everything. Higher education sets the script, in this country at least, all the way down to kindergarten. There is this, actually I'd go lower. You get into the right nursery school to go to the right preschool to get into the right kindergarten to get into the right grade school to get into the right high school to go to the right college. Um, in certain sectors, that is the, the planned trajectory. And what's missing there, which the students feel, is so what and then what? Um, and really, in so many ways, we have maintained the old factory model of education that the purpose is that you can get a job. And we are accountable as an institution to that in our, in our data. Uh, well, what, what's the employment possibility from that job? And again, somehow we come back to this question of, well, what is the human being? And what really are we all doing here on this earth in these bodies, um, which this process of education we hope is facilitated? So. The Isley theory of readiness. I'm so annoyed at the readiness theory. We, as you're saying, yes, preschool readies us for kindergarten ready us for elementary school ready us for high school for college college ready us for a career career ready us for retirement retirement ready us for the grave <laughs> and this is we were talking yesterday about the death uh, I, the idea of death and Plowden in the Plowden report uh, he very nicely said to live life fully as a child is the best preparation for adulthood. So my point when I talk to students about all this readiness, the implication is we're not we're always not there yet. We're always not enough. Not not enough. We we still have more to go and, and heaven forbid we should be at the third grade level. We worked really hard to get through that second grade and now by golly we're there, but oh oh look, look, oh look. You're not yet in the fourth grade. We need to ready you for the this kind of thing has been driving me crazy. Yeah. So we pulled out a couple of quotes for you that we thought we'd just pepper the conversation with. Um, so I thought I'd read this now because it speaks directly this to what you just said. So this is the mother again. She says, <clears throat> To learn for the sake of knowledge, to study in order to know the secrets of nature and life, to educate oneself in order to grow in consciousness. To discipline oneself in order to become master of oneself. To overcome one's weaknesses, incapacities and ignorance. To prepare oneself to advance in life towards a goal that is nobler and vaster, more generous and more true. They hardly give it a thought and consider it all very utopian. The only thing that matters is to be practical, to prepare themselves, and learn how to earn money. Yeah, I mean, this is actually, this narrative is actually part of my life and my upbringing, and I wasn't even aware of it until I came to study at CIS, because that's, I, I don't know if you all read my bio, but, I was a student at CIS before I was staff and faculty here, so I have this multivalent perspective of integral education, and yeah, you don't know what you don't know. I mean, I like to think that I came to CIS and I learned how to breathe, and I learned about my posture was going like this, and um, it's not necessarily something that the teacher mentioned in the classroom, but it was being in the Bay Area and being around people here at CIS because it's it's in and out of the classroom. We, we don't have a community per se like Oroville, but um, this place affords a community of like-minded people. Um, so you can have those conversations and explorations. And I think also the Bay Area lends itself to what's happening here. Like, 
I mean, I was surprised that we have our own compost and recycling, and I'm, you know, you go an hour east and that isn't there. So, so it's kind of like a little hub here with CIS in San Francisco. Um, but what is integral, edu integral higher education? I feel like, on the one hand, I don't know if people know, but CIS, we're celebrating our Golden Jubilee this year, turned 50, so we've got some experience under our belt. And also, I mean, my, my dissertation research was uh, exploring the personal and professional value of an integral education through an interviewing and surveying our alumni in the East-West Psychology Program. And there are handfuls of little writings about integral education at CIS, but I feel like this is one of the first actual research studies trying to get information from people who are here. So it's like, I also feel like there's so much more left to be explored. Um, we have our founding principles that sort of act as a beacon for the school, um, you know, to embody mind, body, and spirit, you know, in the classroom and in our lives. But what does that actually mean? Um, it could be something like breathing before we do a panel. It seems simple, but it's, it's bringing intention to every situation. It's making the ordinary extraordinary or sacred again and again and again. Um, and also I feel like, and this isn't my phrasing, uh, uh, our former president, Joe Subiando, likened CIS to a living laboratory and that resonates with me because um, we're practicing what we're trying to do and we're always like looking at what we're doing and reflecting and assessing and integrating, you know, more into that. So it's, it's, it's evolutionary in the sense that it's not like we got it, we've got integral down pat, it's, it's like, no, we're always a work in practice and we're always looking for greater and greater wholeness or integration and that evolutionary piece doesn't mean that we're going to make it. It's like when we get to somewhere, it's something else might emerge that we didn't see before. And not to say that it's some hierarchical thing, but it's more of, like, like has been mentioned today, it's this unfolding in collaboration with something, some depths of being. One characteristic of higher education that I think can be helpful, you can attest to this or not, uh, with the concerns that you're, you're expressing, is the fact that it is in fact, if not non-graded, it is multi-graded or multi-aged. And in a college classroom, you often have people from different generations, different ages. Um, at the University of Washington Bothell, my post -bec class has students in it who are in their 20s, yes, who might have might be there because mom said, gee, make a good teacher, but they also have students in their 30s and their 40s and their 50s. Uh, they all have at least one degree. They all have a bachelor's of some sort or the equivalent. They may have masters, some have doctorates, but what they don't have is a teaching certificate. So they know why they are there. They have lived life, they have raised kids, they have worked in schools, they, they know, they, they've been in, in other jobs in, in the corporate America, even whatever they've come here coming from. And conversations with them are fabulous. They're wonderful fun for me, and hopefully for them as well. <clears throat> but I would, I would hope that, that being true of many higher education classes, that that could be helpful in um, sharing those experiences and helping them to realize they're not alone in, in experiencing what they are. So that, that was one thought that I had as you were talking. Um, <clears throat> I'm also aware 
that I may be teaching content in my university classroom, but I'm always modeling pedagogy, even when I don't realize it. <clears throat> and that, um, we have fun with that. Because I'll say, after, after I walk away from a student who's speaking, instead of our natural inclination to walk toward them, and therefore miss, lose everyone else in the classroom, I'll walk away so that that student will speak up, because they're still speaking to me. I'll say, do you, do you see what I just did? And we'll talk about the pedagogy behind uh, my, my instruction and content. Or I might say, I might release them to small group conversations and then say, oh, wait, 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 I forgot to tell you. And I'll say, now, did you see what I just did? Don't ever do that. And give them examples of uh, really pedagogy that's not useful. So we, we play with that, and I'm, and I'm conscious that they are in my class for more than learning about Dewey and improper fractions. <laughs> um, I use, uh, I talk about ways that students learn through using the cold um, learning styles. The, how we take in information, how we process information. And in this way, I think I'm, I'm considering the principle of near to far. We're starting with how I learn and how I learn best, assuming, of course, that everyone learns that way, learning that that's not so. And therefore, how can I zero in on those other folks who are in my classroom and are having struggles that I want to help with, and I need to get to know that those people and how they are learning in order to, even as a classmate, much less as a teacher, how I can help them by understanding the differences in the way we learn. Additional thoughts? Not sure where this is on the list, but it really struck me as, as a thread of integral education, this idea of modeling, and that uh, Parker Palmer, who speaks of the courage to teach and really looks at the role of this deed of teaching, basically sums it up by saying we teach who we are. Um, and I think that is something in an integral way of framing education, that it's not just the child who is there to learn. And this constant interaction, um, one of the interesting facets of Waldorf education is that we do looping on steroids. Uh, and so now it's popular in, class, in schools to think, well, maybe having a teacher for more than one year might actually have some economic advantages. Um, we do it for up to eight. So I had the extraordinary research project of teaching a class of children from the age of six to the age of 14. Um, a few came and went, most stayed. And it is stunning at the end of eighth grade to look at your mannerisms reflected back to you 30 times. Um, but also to recognize, you know, on the very first day of first grade, to recognize some of my greatest teachers are sitting in front of me. They just happen to be in six-year-old bodies. Um, and we're going to have some work to do on this journey. And I, I'm wondering a little bit, Heidi, how that plays out in the higher education field. I think we are less, maybe it's less obvious, and yet surely true, because I know I have not stopped yet as a learner. Um, my, my learning tasks are a little different than they were when I was younger. In some ways, they're harder um, and require a bit more humility. But you know, how does that translate this role of the teacher? Well, I just feel like it, it's, it, the modeling is really important because if we're talking about you know a whole person approach to education, but I'm an educator who's not doing you know my emotional work, or you know if I'm just never able to go for a walk outside or something like that, then I'm not walking the talk. I'm not, I'm not, you know, being an example for students to be approaching their lives as, as whole people. Um, so I feel like that's sort of, at least for me, and I'm excited to be doing research with our faculty here about integral education, well, just really their teaching philosophy and classroom practice, and we'll look at to see how you know, it lines up. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, but it was going to be also, I wanted to comment on something that Suri Maya was saying, because I think it ties in. It's like when you're in a more mainstream or traditional higher education setting, like myself, I went to a state university for my undergraduate. And it's like, I didn't know until I came to CIS that I was operating from the neck up. Like, this just wasn't, like, part of my life experience, and I'm not even exaggerating. You know, I realized I had been living my life thus far, you know, shallow breathing. And I'm like, oh, this is like what a full breath feels like. <laughs> so it's, and, and then, you know, so back to modeling and educators, and an integral institution. Yeah, it's having that lifelong learner attitude, and I feel that too. There might not be six-year-olds in my classroom, but I, when I'm in front of a classroom as the teacher, it's almost like I'm learning more than they are most times. So, I mean, that's an attitude of a teacher. I don't know how widespread it is here, but I feel like that's sort of really foundational. Um, and just to also comment on the different approaches a little bit, it's like, and I didn't learn this term until I came to CIS, but I was subject to a more banking model of education in my undergrad, so in that type of education, it's like the teacher is the knower, and I, as a student, don't really have much to say except to, to prove that I've picked up what they've what knowledge they've deposited in me. Whereas when I came to CIS, it was more of this unfolding, like, and I was a collaborator and a learner and a teacher simultaneously. Um, Yeah, so I mean, in a sort of little nutshell, if you want to put it in a nutshell, I feel like some of the aspirations that we strive for at CIS is to, like we've been saying, honor the multidimensionality of our experience. You know, we're more than just an intellect or a brain to be trained. There's multiple lines that we can intentionally develop if, if we're given the space and the encouragement and even the knowing that they're there. Um, so, in addition to the multidimensionality of experience, there's also, you know, ways to gain valid knowledge more than just thinking about something or reading about something, you know. For example, our intuition is valid, and I feel like sometimes in you know, it's under-acknowledged, or even in my own life, it's like, I'll have an intuition, and I won't know it's an intuition until it comes true, and I'm like, oh, I already had some kind of information come to me, but I discarded it, and that is, you know, the result, I think, of me growing up in 21st century United States. Um, so, in the sense of, like, a couple of aspects like that, we were, students I interviewed and surveyed were feeling like really solid, like we're hitting the mark in these areas. Um, so the outcome, I guess, does match in some cases what we're going for. Um, the, the research also revealed some learning edges and I think it comes back to something that you touched on, Suri Maya, about we're kind of in this hub, or some people call it a bubble, and it's like, how do we translate the profundity of the studies and the work that we're doing here into circles outside of CIS, um, or in service learning, and other kinds of professional development opportunities? That's part of the reason why I think I'm still here, because I feel like the very nature of this education that people seek out, that is something we can leverage so if we're um, foregrounding, you know, preparing students to talk about this approach of education, they'll be able to kind of utilize that in their professional pursuits because there is a hunger. It's, it's coming out. And 
I, I can give my alma mater as an example. They just launched this approach to undergrad called integrated clusters. And it's quite interesting. It's not the same lingo that we're using here, but it's resonant. And yeah, people are using the word holistic. People are using the words, you know, social and environmental justice. So diversity and inclusion. So these things are on people's radars and essentially with 50 years under our belt or you know, students who come here for a degree program, it's like they're going to be able to utilize that, but we need to kind of tease it out a little more. Right now, it's like baked in. Students are getting the experiences, but I've started to do that in my classrooms, Jean. Like, so did you notice we just did an arrival practice? Why did we do that? You know, so kind of in my own work, bringing these things out to kind of converse with students as a way to help them reflect on why we're doing certain things, even though we might like to also, you know, breathe or use crayons or, you know, <laughs> why are we doing these things? There's, there's purpose, yeah, and, and there's ways to um, be able to bring this to circles outside CIS, but only if we're aware of it. One more thought, going back to um, our thinking about the classroom as having four walls, is just all the ways, and I know Waldorf does this, all the ways to get children out of that box and out into nature, into the next town, into uh, the, the next country. Um, I've taken students from, you know, Bothell to Oroville and for winter quarter, and then we'll have our course there, course in an intentional uh, international learning, or and, and the, the, the units that uh, Sora was discussing this morning, those units become those students' classrooms. One is volunteering in Thadna Forest, one is volunteering in the, the brick building organization, another is in schools, another is in the free store. Um, so the classroom is, is continually expanding and needs to be a part of uh, what integral education is all about. Expanding those and going from, again, going from near to far. And then, oops, look, farther than that, and oh, even farther than that, um, as they're ready for it. Um, so I'd just like to jump in on the, actually build and expand on the modeling um, prompt you gave us. So, <clears throat> One of the things that has come out as being really important in the oral context, uh, pedagogical context, has been the relationship between teachers and students. So beyond modeling, just I want to talk about kind of the human relation aspect of it. And um, what we see is that, you know, it, it was never uh, experienced as hierarchical. Students, you know, felt that the teachers were their friends. And I can say now genuinely that some of the teachers that I had were, you know, 20, 30 years older than me, continue to be my friends now, friendships that we developed when I was a teenager. Um, so that's really important. And, um, and also, coming back to the other classroom thing which we reintroduced, um, in this qualitative survey about ed education in the last you know, 50 years in Oroville, um, people mentioned so much about how they learned from all of the, from so many community members, whether they were teachers or not. I mean, we literally had one person responding saying, from this person I learned kindness. From this person I learned how to be, you know, true. From this person. So the conception of what, what is education, what is it that I'm learning, and who am I learning it from, was completely, you know, challenged to be so much, so much broader. And coming back to the modeling of that, what I found fascinating is that, I think it was over 80% of these of these people, so who were born and raised in Oroville, who are active in so many different professional fields, all of them reported that one of the things that they do is teaching. And I just think that's fascinating and makes so much sense because they grew up in an environment in which everybody around them was in some ways teaching. So they had that modeled to them, you know, and then here they were kind of being educators in their own fields. So, yeah. <coughs> This is really interesting because um, a lot of the research on mental health in schools 
again and again comes back to the fact that it can be the connection with one, one caring adult that makes a difference to a child's life. And I think that doesn't stop when we stop being so-called children. Um, but this idea of the human connection and that, that of education being an essentially and non-negotiably human activity. And it's interesting because if we look at policy, certainly in this country, the tendency is towards trying to remove the uncertain human element from classrooms. You know, in the 60s there was the thought that it would be the TV that would replace the teacher. Um, didn't go so well. Um, you have these great stories like the LA Unified School District buying you know, a laptop, a, no, a um, iPad for every child and then they couldn't sync the software. The teacher's still there. Um, but this honouring of the teacher and all of us and this idea of the community, because for the young person or the person here, it could be the security guard. He certainly makes my day every morning. Um, it could be the janitor. Uh, but this, this, the evidence is just undeniable. It's this connection, this humanizing of education, which again is very far from the banking model. That I'll put it into you and you'll get points on how you can give it back to me. I was really good at that game, by the way, um, as a student. Um, but, and we only have to watch, I mean, I would challenge any of us to watch a four-year-old unlocking a cell phone and figuring out where the videos and the games are. Mm -hmm. uh, a child who has not been taught this to understand that a whole banking idea of education is maybe just a little bit obsolete in, in the age of technology now. But relationships are the other vital integral piece, I think. Mm -hmm. That's why I stress <coughs> this idea of stress with my students that the most important thing they can do is to get to know those kids mm -hmm. as individuals. In fact, when we're talking about assessment, which we haven't talked about yet, um, I'll find it and wait till we get to assessment before I bring it up. Are we, I'm looking at the clock too. So, <coughs> higher education, yes? So, how it may be understood today, particularly in higher education. Now, considering different modalities of integral education, I think first of like lectures or how do we, you know, how does it look in the classroom? Um, and it's not to say we don't ever have lectures here at the Institute, but I feel like there's more um, spaciousness to invite students to, at least in my classrooms, like students are coming in not as empty slates or blank canvases for me to fill up to go back to that you know, obsolete model. But it's like they're coming in here as knowledge carriers. They have their whole, you know, they might be coming back to do a master's, but they might be 50 years old. So they've got a whole life of learning and experience to bring there. So just kind of holding a classroom space from that premise um, transforms the way a lecture could happen because it might turn more into, you know, a group discussion where we're learning all together with each other from each other rather than I have the information and then you'll all receive it. Um, another thing that you mentioned earlier, Jean, was like, you know, pairing off. You know, because sometimes in a bigger classroom, not everybody has a voice it, or, you know, more introverted folks might be like, I'm not going to share. So doing these different modes of small group or dyads, you know, creates space for everyone to be more involved. Um, and then there's also kind of like a space for experiential learning. And what is experiential learning? Well, it might be that um, we'll, we'll do an activity together or test something out together or 
I mean, just the other day in our, I, I, I'm teaching a class called Leadership Evolution and Transformative Change this semester. And it's awesome because it's, it's not one of the classes where you have to write a final research paper, even though I love writing research papers. But this is a project-based course, so we actually um, facilitated a visualizing activity where students um, made a visit with their future self to, to get inner wisdom. And it's not like people go you know, into an altered state. It's not necessarily even someone's going to visualize something. But the invitation is there for them to be present and welcoming to whatever arises. And then, you know, it doesn't go right back into a lecture from that. There'll be space for quiet, reflective writing, and then maybe there's a dyad share. So there's a way to kind of scaffold experiences uh, more than just lecturing modalities. So I can speak to one specific modality that was developed in Orville, um, not originally in a higher education you know, context, but for children, but it is now being widely adopted by adults. And I spoke about it this morning, so sorry for those of you who are here and for whom this will be repetitive. Um, but that is called Awareness Through the Body. And it's an integral education modality, integral not in the dictionary sense, but really in the Orbindonian sense of the word. Um, in that human beings are made up of um, different planes and parts of the being, psychic, mental, vital, and physical. And so what awareness, and coming back to what you said earlier, right, which is that higher education, you know, you've got to start, your emphasis was saying your bias was that, well, we've got to actually look from a really young age, right? Um, and so what this modality offers um, children is a chance to actually become aware of these different planes and parts of the being from a really young age in ways that are really accessible, um, that, aren't, uh, that aren't based on an intellectual way of approaching them at all, but are based very much on the experiential, and that's something we haven't <coughs> yet touched on, is that whole experiential uh, dimension. I won't you know, describe the modality in detail now, but just to say that in my experience, that then becomes, coming back to starting young, if you do that young, it then becomes second nature. And then you have this experience, which it sounds like unfortunately you, know, you, were, you had this neck up thing until you, know, you came into an environment that offered you that. You have the experience from a really young age of being a whole being, and I think that that fundamentally will you know, influence how you approach any kind of learning um, eventually. So that said, um, and while modalities you know, are incredibly important in all of the ways that you raise in terms of how do we kind of diversify the approaches and the prompts and the ways that um, very different people will be able to engage. Um, on the other end of the spectrum of modality, you have what Mother called free progress. Right? <laughs> so sort of the absence of a modality, one could argue. Um, the absence of a modality, but yet within a facilitative framework. And I think that's very important. <coughs> And coming back to uh, my talk on oral on Friday nights is you don't just have this free progress or experimentation in a vacuum. Because I think that one of the things that we've seen and experienced in Orville as well is the fallout of that. When you don't have boundaries, when you don't have a framework and you just kind of let it loose, then it, those can be really actually scarring experiences mm -hmm. in which children don't feel safe, don't feel held. Um, and I would argue, you know, even you know, in, in kind of the spiritual or psycho-spiritual uh, modalities that adults experience, often if you don't have a safe space, they can be um, kind of ruinous um, and psychologically damaging. So, free progress, but you know, within within a framework that's that's, and that's where the clarity and the intention is held. But that being less about a modality and more about the teacher, educator, um, <clears throat> able to facilitate a process, you know, which is going to look different, potentially, uh, for every human being. Um, picking up on what we said this morning, in which uh, Katya, you asked about, you know, do we have, you sort of asked the same question, do we have any kind of modalities in which collectively, you know, we kind of grow together? 
And um, in the talk earlier, we talked about Orville as a divine anarchy, spiritual anarchy. And I like to think of it both as a site of spiritual anarchy and anarchist spirituality, you know, where then you also experience your spiritual path in whatever way authentically arises for you. that is multi-age, that fosters curiosity, uh, in which curiosity is uh, encouraged. And I have to tell a story here. One time I was teaching in a multi-age, um, I was teaching in a two-room schoolhouse in Vermont. I had the one, two, three, and then there was the, the lunchroom, and then there was four, five, six. And in the, um, in the springtime, when the snows on our playground that, playground that went up a hill melted, we discovered, quite excited to see, a skeleton of a small creature that had been there, apparently died during the fall, who knows. <clears throat> but most of, some of, of the substance of the body was there, but the, mostly it was bones. We were so excited, we brought that right down immediately into the classroom and launched a study of bones of course, and which bones, which, which uh, joints go round and round, which only go in two directions, what might be your equivalent of that bone, how can we put it together, and finally, what do we think it is? But we didn't start there, just took a look at, at bones. And that, um, I'm not sure what my point was. It was, sort of, it was a good, excellent, a good uh, <laughs> example of whatever point I was after. <laughs> the flexible, the curiosity, the, the, uh, the classroom fosters curiosity. And sure, we had some things that were in my plan book to do. That, those initially, those go right away. When you find a skeleton in your playground, you go with it. Resources and conditions. Um, I feel like I wanted to say something and then I got wrapped up in your story, Jean. Um, I just, the first condition I feel like is just a, it's some, some attitude with, with the student. Like they're not, you're, you're not going to get students at CIS who want to, you know, study math and, and don't care about their own psycho-spiritual unfolding. So in that sense, it's kind of like, it makes me think of a story too, because I, I, I've been blessed to have some opportunities to guest lecture at Diablo Valley College, which is just across the bay here. And my, I it was a general psychology class and a transpersonal psychology class, so I got to talk about consciousness. Um, and you know, I tried to infiltrate a couple little things, like we started with a mindful moment and. And then we also kind of had some generative questions for a group discussion. And at the end of, you know, you could see people on your cell phones. There was like 60 or 70 people in an amphitheater type classroom. But you could also see people like looking at me and nodding. So there was a mixed group in there. There were some people who were really like, what is this? What are we talking about? I, I want to know more. And there were some people who were kind of like, you know, just whatever. So it's sort of like I'm pointing to some sort of readiness, I guess, from a student because I'm, you know, it, you, you, otherwise it's like I'm not here to try to talk with you or have dialogues or, you know, work in this vein. I, I'm not trying to put something on people, but it's more 
about, yeah, and that's a personal thing. I mean, if I just reflect on my own life, I was in undergrad and going along because I had to go to college because my mom said so, and it was to get my job. But then when I found out about how psychology could be related to spirituality and, you know, there's a lot of other avenues to take in the field of psychology, not just studying rats in a maze or, you know, cognitive learning. Uh, so it just kind of reignited or it made me remember that I love learning. So, so it's also kind of something about a being a seeker, you know, seeking learning, seeking to know what you don't know. Um, and then to go back to something we've already all touched on is something to do with the educators. Um, if, if I'm not, you know, intentionally participating in a, in a process of self-actualization, you know, maybe integral education isn't right for me because I won't be able to model that or just be that. It's not like I'm in the classroom saying, hey, this morning I was meditating and then I wrote in my journal and I really had this insight into why I reacted that way. Um, it, it's more of just somehow it shows up in your presence and, and if students ask you, you know, you can talk with them. Like, so I guess those are two things. Um, what strikes me from what you just said, and I thought about it immediately actually once Jean ran out this question, is the very first line of to be a true Orvinian, which says, the first necessity is the inner discovery. I think that's a kind of pretty basic condition <laughs> in order to, for integral education to happen. Um, the other thing I will say is conscious community. Uh, because I think that, you know, as we brought brought forth in this conversation, integral education requires uh, relationality. And I think that it is deepened, you know, it, it needs to be held within a certain field in order for this process, which is a relational process, to happen. Um, and then what leads on to that is space. You need the space that can facilitate, that can facilitate that. CIS is such a space. You know, I can, I can feel it, you know, in my body. It feels very different than when I walk into the University of Sussex, which is where I study now. Um, and then Orville is, you know, a really wonderful space because it's even, you know, it doesn't even have walls. <laughs> it's this, it's this huge space. Um, so those would be the three things. So I'm sitting here thinking, how would I address this? And I can give a list of obvious resources, conditions, but I actually think we have to go more radical. And that we have to, we have to ask those of us who are drawn to centers like this, or to Oroville, who are lucky enough to be able to engage in this type of dialogue and questioning, we have to ask how we can begin to affect a bigger dialogue around the purpose and definition of human life. And I, I'm going that big. Um, because if we say that education is a human process, and if we talk about um, the education process being about becoming, or drawing out what is already there, or what, what, however we define it, um, it's, that is so at odds with a lot of how we commoditize and, and restrict and speak of education. So I didn't plan to do this, but I've gone much bigger as to how do we, uh, here or at Oroville, as I know here, we're an endangered species. Mm -hmm. We're a small outpost asking these questions. Um, and it's not so easy to do that, both internally and externally, as it was certainly in 1968, when I think the dialogue was more open. So how do we find ways of translating some of these questions into more, more common discourse, even within our own institutions, and asking these questions about what is it we're trying to do here? Um, and again, I go back to the young child because I think if higher education is to be integral, it needs students who are ready, 
who are open to the question, who are willing to take up the real work. And interestingly, in a system that is governed by economics, the largest, loudest economic model is completely ignored. People like James Heckman who says, you know, if you want to look at investment, you get much better return bang for your buck, which we like in this country, the younger the child. And we actually practice the exact inversion of that. Uh, the younger the child, the less we invest. Um, so I think the preconditions are to start to have courage um, and I, I don't actually know what that means, to engage in a broader and deeper dialogue. And I think it has to begin within the walls, I'm using walls, of this type of institution where we can easily go to sleep and forget that this is a seedbed for the acorns, for the oaks. This is a seedbed to protect and nurture these questions around what is the nature of the human being, what is the purpose of, it, of education? How do we strengthen connection within ourselves, between ourselves, with the world and with the, the earth and cosmos? Um, and, and to value the opportunity that we have here, or an oracle, or that we each carry. So that's not a very satisfactory list, but I think it's an important part of the dialogue. And just stretching out one of those threads, seeing um, the teacher intentionally doing this, seeing each other as resources. We are the resources. We, we can learn as much from one another as from any book. And, and clearly from ourselves, from getting in touch with our own truth. Yeah, so yes. Any other resources and conditions? Well, let's go on to in practice. <clears throat> what does it look like? You're going into a classroom of any age where integral education is being practiced and the children are experiencing some of the things that we have talked about. What do you see? What does it look like? Here are the stories. We talked a little, a little bit about this this morning, and I know when I first came into this building, I, I'd been around the periphery of CIIS for a good number of years, thanks to my good friends. Um, but there was a, you mentioned it as well, Sir Umay, there was a feeling of, okay, there is a different quality here. And I think what you're asking us is to dissect that quality. Um, if we could find a common theme of why are we all in this building, I think we may boil it down to the word meaning. We're all engaged in questions about meaning, whether we're here to be a drama therapist or a philosopher. Well, maybe that's the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. So there is a, a level to the dialogue and the questioning and the being that is not exactly quantifiable but lives here. And then there are, I'll just name a few and pass it on, uh, places for quiet. You know, we have a roof meditation garden. It's very small, but it's there. So in the middle of this very, very odd part of San Francisco, there's no other word for it, it's very odd, um, there's, there's an oasis, literally consciously created. Uh, images of the sacred that can somehow, without you know the, the, the term religion, can somehow invite us to come back to ourselves. Um, so they are just a few that are coming to mind. Um, I'm going to go outside of the classroom walls again, <laughs> um, and talk about you know think about integral education and how it's pra how it's practiced in Oral. Um, and I'm going to conflate two terms here, which, you know, maybe is not absolutely correct, but I think it's, it's going to add something to the dialogue, uh, which is unending education. Um, so in Orville and Orville's charter, it says that Orville will be the site of an unending education. And I think about unending education in the Orville context in several ways. I think about it as unending because not only is it unending in that it goes outside of the self and sort of looks at the outside world, but it is 
especially on ending and that it goes inside. And we all know that exploration is infinite, right? So there's both, there's this kind of cross-dimensionality that's happening, which is what makes it integral, too, because you're looking at that dimension of spirit. Um, and I would say that it's unending also, you raised earlier, and um, about Sarah had mentioned the units, you know, in Orville and the kind of various learning spaces and that people are invited to engage in all those spaces. So I would say that it's unending also in that sense, in that it's not it's not ascribed to one space that's considered a pedagogical institution, whatever that might be, but it's unending in that it enters into all of these different aspects and spaces of, of the society. And that, again, is because Orville is a whole kind of learning environment. Um, you asked Liz about how do we kind of broaden the dialogue, uh, how do we broaden the, the message and the outreach. And another way in which I think about Orville as a space of unending education is that there is that outreach. It's open to so many different levels of participation, whether it's people who are volunteering, interning, or who have grown up there, or whether it's you know people who live there and who are approaching their everyday life as a process of their own self-cultivation, which is an educational process. Um, and I would even say, you know, that the people who work there. Um, I haven't done an immense amount of research on this, but I have done a little bit. And what we hear about uh, from people who work there, so I'm talking about local Tamil laborers, is that they, and it's shown in some of the videos that you might see on Orville, that they have um, had so mu many, um, so much more opportunity than they, than they would have had otherwise, specifically women who enter and who a lot of them now have become managers, you know, uh, man at the man managerial level of some of these Orville units. So there's just so, so many ways in which we can think about Orville as an unending um, space of education. And there's that transmission that happens because it is a space like in CIS that when you enter it, there is a certain field um, that's there in which you're experiencing something deeper than just the immediate work or activity that you're engaging with. I'd like to share with you something that I brought when I first started thinking about this panel and being here and talking about equal education. What came into my mind is something from my past that was in fact published in 68 called the Vermont Design for Education. Has anyone ever heard of this? That's fine. Um, I want you to become acquainted with the Vermont Design for Education. This was a document put out unbelievably by the State Department of all places. <clears throat> and it, it uh, provides guidance for how to, essentially how to hold an integral education classroom. It's, it's it. And I don't know, of course, Mother, Mother and Tree Rabinda published those three principles I mentioned before much earlier than this. And I'm curious now as to how much the folks who wrote this might have been influenced like, by that. I was unaware, as I said, of Shri Rabindu and Mother when I was in my formative years and, and seeing this. Things like, an individual must be allowed to work according to his own abilities. The development of an individual's thought process should be primary. Um, emphasis should be on a child's own way of learning through discovery and exploration, re through real rather than abstract experiences. Hmm. What a concept. Um, all people need success to process. To process. And there's the, the student must be accepted as a person. I'd like to just hand these around. You can take a look at them because I was just struck by the similarity, the overlap. You can just take a look and pass them along. So that to me is part of what an integral education classroom looks like, the things that are reflected in this. this was, these are the open education days in Vermont uh, in the 60s and 70s. And they are to me a, a wonderful example this wonderful example of what we now refer to here as integral education, although we didn't use that term then. What is it? I'm wondering if you could see if there are any questions. 
Mm -hmm. Let's wait for a bit um, because there's still some some stories of practice that I would like to to share as well as here. <clears throat> the question being, what does it look like in a classroom? Thank you for sharing that Vermont education packet. Um, something that came up as you were sharing that is like this attitude that we that we as educators here try to you know, foster and practice is about meeting students where they're at, you know. And you mentioned it too. Success for one might look completely different from another, you know, I could have a student who just came here from Thailand in the same class as someone who's returning to school after, you know, 30 years. So it's like, I want to help each of them succeed and the bar for each of those people might be in different places, but it's appropriate for them and, and to get them a little bit further along on their path. So I guess that's kind of a, attitude of the educator, how you hold the space in the classroom. Um, I sort of talked about this, I guess, in the modality section, but I'll just say something a little bit more. Like, you know, you might see people in the classroom, you know, coloring and think, well, what is this? But if you think about it as a way to connect with the imaginal and psychic realms, because those realms of experience do not communicate through spoken language, then it brings a whole other dimension. But it also connects to the play piece. It's like I, I feel like Liz brought that up very early on about the importance of play. It's like just because we're grown up doesn't, that doesn't mean that loses its importance. I can remember my first class, very first class here, and I almost went bolted for the door because they asked us to pretend that we were trees and wander around the room. And I was like, what, what universe did I just walk into? But it goes back to the importance of play, you know, and, and building community, which, which are two things we've been talking about as important for learning. Um, so I kind of just went along with it because I wanted to, you know, participate fully. I just came all the way from New England to be here. And, uh, you know, looking back on it, it was a way that the professors were getting the group to kind of form some sort of cohesion to set the, set the tone for the, for the semester. So some things that we might not expect to see in a classroom and end up being very important to foster learning. One thing that always surprises my students in a human growth and learning course, we're talking about the babies crawling. We have a video showing which bones are going which ways and how the babies are crawling. And I'll say, I'll stop the video and say, how do you crawl? Oh, well, we put, I said, let's find out. Do you do alternate? Do you do the same? What do you do, the elephant crawl or the alternate? And, and I'll say, okay, everybody down on the floor, we're going to crawl. And they go, what? I've never been in a class where we were asked to crawl, much less be trees. So yes, using the whole body, encouraging them to interact with one another and, and feel, feel what it feels like to be a young child. Put yourself in that place. And another, other examples are putting yourselves in places of historical figures. Role play is one of, the, one of my most fam um, popular things to do putting yourself in the place of that person in history in order to find out what they were really feeling, what they were really experiencing and, and desiring. It's another, another example. I do have to tell you one more example of, of uh, this was Chris. Chris was a little, uh, if, if I were to call my one, two, three, first grade, second grade, third grade, he would probably be termed a second grader, but he wasn't a second grader in most ways. He was who he was, and he was learning at a level where he was. He learned how to read from a dinosaur inside the dinosaur books. He loved dinosaurs. He adored dinosaurs. And we did have the Dick and Jane books there, because some people did gravitate toward those, and that was fine. 
But Chris learned from a dinosaur book, several. And he came to me one day and said, Mrs. Heisley, Pteranodon has 2,000 teeth. I said, wow, Chris, 2,000. What would that look like? Well, it would fill up this whole room. I said, let's gather 2,000 things and let's take a look and see what 2,000 looks like. Okay, he went back. We had the classroom with all kinds of junk stuff in it, the, the bottle caps and the corks and those things. He started out one, two, and you can see he wasn't going to get very far with that. Here's Chris. He's into science. He's into literature that he had just read. He's doing math in a major way, discovering on his own the essence of 2000. He finally, finally he discovered that he wasn't going to get very far doing one at a time. He took a handful of blocks because he knew that he could hold five blocks in his hand. He was counting by fives. And then he put all the things that he had into one side of the balance scale and balanced it and doubled his number. And eventually, it took two days, he got to uh, 2,000. And we all stood around, we stood in a circle around these 2,000 things in a pile, gave him much credit for all of this hard work and appreciated what 2,000 looked like. That, that is an example to me of using his interests, exploring him and helping him to stretch integrated learning and integrated curriculum, if you will. After a while, I was going crazy listening to every project he did was about dinosaurs, and I just couldn't stand listening anymore. I went to the phone during one of his sharing times, and I called one of the school board members and said, I can't stand it. I have to take Chris to New York City so he can see Tyrannosaurus rex in the Natural History Museum. I just have to. And she said, well, I can't really make it an official trip, but I'll pass the hat and see what my friends and I can come up with. They came up with enough to send my husband and myself and three little boys who had never left the valley to New York City for three days and two nights. And watching Chris, there were a lot of stories in that time, but watching Chris stand in front of Tyrannosaurus Rex was just, was worth every bit of it. I just, I love the story I had to share with you. Thank you for indulging me. <laughs> Other examples of what it looks like in a classroom? Exploration, real things. We have time for questions from you. Questions, comments? Uh, is there a mic that can... It's okay. Here it is. So as a parent, uh, I have two daughters. Uh, one is an undergrad, and the second one is about to go to college. And uh, my wife, we got introduced to Sri Aurobindo and Mother through my wife. So we, the, since they grew up, they had the touch, and we used to go to study circles and learn more about what is this whole thing and uh, be close to ourselves or so, but now they're already part of this uh, factory <laughs> and uh, how can, what can we do, uh, because uh, she, she's going to apply for colleges, the 90 or 80 percent of the system, the education system, uh, and we know that this is the true learning, how as a parent can we do something about uh, that even though they are going to be part of that system, they can be close to something like this. Parents can certainly expand what their children are learning in, in whatever classroom it is. Uh, with day trips here and there, with questioning, with conversation over the dinner table. Um, that's what first came to mind, and just ways that you can expand what they're learning and, and hear them. When, you're, when your children come home with stories of school, hear them, listen to them, let them play it out in their own words uh, and know that they have been heard. Uh, 
I think one thing I'd like to say and then hand it over here is, you know, the conundrum of being a parent is that we raise them to be independent and then go it, they go and do it. Um, and that we can't continue to control their environment and, and they're in this time and this place and they may have the experience of trying it and dropping out or figuring out the rules and succeeding. But I think to reassure you, what has been developed and strengthened and planted as the essential self doesn't go away. And I would be interested, Surumai, as you had that experience and, and what you did. Um, yeah, I mean, I would just emphasize what you just said, um, which is that each person goes through their own process and that if they have been exposed to, to that kind of reality and that kind of experience from, you know, from a young age, that that doesn't go away but that there is a need for some people to come across, to come up against situations in which that's not present in order to feel difference um, and then go through whatever process they're gonna go through with that and then choose whatever they're ultimately you know, going to choose. I think it's hard to determine someone else's journey. Can I say one more thing? Um, I think that there's a tendency it, when we come up against something that we disagree with or wish it were different, we term it wrong. Or we term it not enough or not as good as something else. And instead of that, to the degree that we can accept it and trust it as necessary in our own development, um, in providing a struggle that we need to go through and value that experience for what it is and what, what, uh, it, how it can be a positive experience. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, this has been very rich, and thank you very much. Uh, quite a few times in the course of the panel, um, you're giving positive examples or lamenting <laughs> something that wasn't present. And uh, each time you did that, uh, it occurred to me that uh, uh, the wall of approach, which Liz uh, uh, goes so well, and uh, the spirit of windows and the mother's approach have the same four levels. Right? The physical, the vital, and spirit of windows, the physical, the vital, the mental, and then what's called the psychic entity, and what uh, Real Spider and uh, Waldorf has is uh, the physical, the etheric, the mental, and the eye, all right? And what I've noticed in this conversation, what I've noticed also in this school, is that there's a tendency to talk about three levels, namely body, mind, and spirit, or I, jumping over the etheric or the vital. And that's, I believe, what you experience when you come into an environment which is alive, and what you unconsciously lament when the vital, the etheric, is not built up. And so how is it built up? It's built up, like uh, Heidi said, uh, coherence. And somebody else said relation. Somebody else said, another word for this is affect. There are many, many words that we use without realizing that it is a, an entire level of human and uh, cosmic experience that needs to be consciously built and need to be identified when it's missing. And I believe one of the reasons it's not built and not identified, well, two reasons. One is we actually don't carry that category. We All these places that we know that are trying to do something like what we're trying to do, does body, mind, and spirit. and doesn't include that other element. The other reason is we in, in education from childhood to graduate, it develops disciplines for the three levels, but does not have movement, does not have sufficient art, does not have sufficient emphasis on rhythms or patterns or opportunities for uh, sharing or building <coughs> an, a, a, um, a, uh, a community or a coherent community of individuals striving for uh, a group experience. All of that is work that has, can and should be done by institutions such as Oroville and CIS and is absolutely not being done almost anywhere else. So just one more thing, 
most of what you have said positively today, I think you will find in John Dewey. Yes. <coughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Charles Center. Mm -hmm. Charles Center. Of a mantra. Activity oriented, yes. Um, I have a question around the role of education in the evolution of society. Um, so, how much or what is it that we need to do for uh, integral education to be a more effective force for cultural evolution rather than for education in general and just we, like in higher education, continue to uh, maybe play along the game or the expectation of what the larger cultural norms right now, specifically economic uh, uh, system. So I'm, I'm trying to um, understand what is your perspective in terms of, I mean, we're in a transition, right? So we are, we're still capitalists, but we are questioning it, and there are a lot of social experiments around what, what does it look to have value-driven institutions. So when we look at education, traditionally, education is one of the ways in which we transmit values and, and keep going cultures, but also is the way we create the possibility for change and for transformation. So where do you see integral education today as that kind of cultural evolution force? And what do we need to do in order to really support more of that external change rather? I mean, I think CIS students and graduates still want to find a job. It wouldn't be too helpful for all the graduates to be absolutely enlightened beings and not be able to survive in current society, right? Like you have a metric that has to figure out like we are relevant and yet you don't want to push the pendulum to just conforming completely to what is right now that economic system. So anyway, any thoughts? And I have a daughter that just graduated from, from kindergarten to high school and from uh, Wilder Education and I can see her and I could see it also in the parents in the school community like the moment they got into middle school, they was like this, like, oh, are they going to be successful, right? Like, kindergarten was easy, like, of course, great magical environment for them to express themselves, whole things. But when we get now closer to them getting to high school and then college, like, those readiness decisions really start to, and you start seeing the families living for those because, like, my kid is not going to survive. So anyway, that's kind of some of the issues that I'm struggling with. <laughs> That's a really big question. Um, you know, I spent many years in Waldorf schools um, happy with the idea of creating seeds of light. That these young people would go out, as they do, and they do remarkable things and they have an impact. Um, I go back, and, and you're absolutely right, you know, we can put up with this childish stuff for a while. I mean, I'm being a little cynical, but then we have to get real. Let's buckle down now and get real, and get them ready for the real world, as if the world of a child is not their real world. Um, but I come back to where I think I'm arriving as I see what is happening, and I see the debate around education, and really about humanity, and the seeds of light for me are no longer enough. Um, I think we have to be, as educators, looking at systems, being willing to challenge and to speak up on behalf of what we know to be true. Um, and yet it is this interesting tension between form and freedom, which has come up again and again this afternoon, I think, that you've got to be able to be within the form enough to survive and to do your work. And yet within that, you have to be cultivating true cultural freedom. Um, so what does that mean to be more radical? I think voices are starting to unite, at least in the education field. Um, I'm part of a round table that meets a couple of times a year in DC, and we're really asking what, what's the ground we can all stand on, and it's starting to have an impact on policy. So um, maybe one of the dangers of a place like CIIS, I think it's probably less so of Oroville or Waldorf School, is that it becomes its own protective mm. environment and the needs now are urgent. Uh, the stakes are very high and it's not enough, at least for me anymore, to stay just where, where I'm happy and comfortable. 
So it's not just the students we send out. We have to be finding a way of speaking our truth. And I can't exactly say what that means, except maybe events like this are a step in the right direction. Thank you. I second everything you said. And thank you, Katya, for the question. I have several. Yeah, I have several thoughts. I hope I'll remember them all. Um, one thing is, I completely agree with you. Um, you know, you need, and I think Orville is an example of this. You, you need a whole different society <laughs> for this kind of, you know, education to be really relevant within and to deliver deliver its own promises, right? I mean, they're kind of so contiguous. Um, but the one informs the other, and it's you know we just have to we have to do all of these things in tandem because we're not going to get the Marxist you know idea that all of a sudden we're going to change and and it's going to be a different society. And history has shown that it doesn't work like that, unfortunately. Um, one thing that I will say around you know how can this serve so the evolution of society and of consciousness. And Bindu raised this earlier. It's actually a Sri Bindonian, a strong Sri Bindonian uh, concept where he says that it's. In the indivi individual, rather the collective, is where you have the space for dynamism and freedom and, and evolution, right? And so I would say, uh, <coughs> cultivating really radical authenticity in in human beings, so that they can then go and be in the world and be these whole selves, and by by their being, you know, transform transform the world that they're in. Um, and coming back to the society, and this is something that. Uh, again, Bindu and I, in both our presentations, really emphasized sort of, you know, Orville kind of as revolution to evolution. And one thing that we didn't highlight, that highlight, but I think should be, is that revolution continues in Orville on a daily basis because we continue to question our own institutions, we continue to change them, we continue to say, okay, this is not good enough, we've got to do better. And as someone who grew up in that environment, I can say that it was incredibly formative to be in an environment in which I was taught, and not, again, not taught in a classroom, but it was just, you know, it was just the whole thing that we we're living in. And through which I learned that you can challenge these systems and you can effect change. Um, and I think that that's incredibly important. And, again, we don't learn this in history, but the only way that change has ever happened, and there's this really famous Margaret Mead quote, right, where she says, um, Something like, never doubt that a small group of conscious citizens or concerned citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Um, so hopefully education will you know, create those beings and uh, we'll be part of the change. So Suryamay and others, in the spirit of dialogue, I'd like to follow up on you. And I would like to differ with you this time <laughs> in the spirit of being on our within. And what I'm missing from this conversation is the narrow definition of the word integral. And integral has become like both in CIS is almost about the integral transformation of consciousness. I'm not surprised because Shurabhans and the Mata's whole agenda was the evolution and transformation of consciousness. And yeah, so I just leave it at that. Because Shubhano speaks of it that way as why he doesn't engage in social work. He says that's primary for him. And that's how he brought it to support. But I invite us again not to look at their teachings as timeless truths, to see them in social historical constructs. I'm sorry, but Shubhano passed away in 1950, the mother passed away in 1972, before we had the pressing problems or the environmental problems today. And that's why I like Katya's questions. What are we doing in Orville at CIS to, you know, has powerful cultural agents of change? I'm sorry, I'm really passionate because some of the people, pedagogues that I've been inspired in my teaching career are Colin Friday, Pedagogy of Operas, Bell Hooks, Pedagogy of Hope. And uh, lately, I've spent five years working with uh, Monica Sharma, who wrote this book, Radical Transformation Leadership, and really gave us tools in both keeping the individual consciousness and um, working systematically in the outside world. So I'd love for the panel to address some of these issues that I'm bringing up. Um, 
I raised this in my in my talk on Friday evening as well, which is that you know a common criticism of intentional communities is that they are insular, right? Um, and you know I'm I'm not sure I'm not sure how helpful it is to judge what's better, um, activism or you know creating the alternative. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, it's an open question, you know. I'm, I'm not sure it's helpful to pit them against one another to say is one better, better than the other. I think um, we should, should is a loaded word, but respect the choices of people who choose to say my revolution is to build the alternative, you know, as well as those who say my revolution is to stay in the mainstream and challenge that. So I think I would invite, invite us into a much more sort of pluralistic understanding that these kinds of revolutions or the ways in which people affect change that there are just multiple and people take up different ones and all of that is part of a tapestry of, of transformation. Um, and I totally agree with you, you know, around the, the consciousness piece, of course, that you raised earlier. Um, however, as Sauro's presentation really brought up this morning, you know, one of the things that Orville is really good at, I don't know enough about CIS to comment on that, <laughs> is to have both of those things happening at once. However, I'm not sure that it's always the same people. You know, I think in Orville we have, uh, well, I was going to say the same thing at once, in that it is a center that's creating a, an alternative, and there's an enormous amount of outreach. But I think that within that, you have, you have a lot of people who live very much a reclusive lifestyle and who choose to focus, you know, really kind of internally on a sort of internal um, yogic, you know, very simple lifestyle. And you have people who choose to do a lot of outreach work. So you still have that plurality, you know, within it. Um, so yeah, that's what I can offer in response to that thought. I think, I, I think this is connected. Um, I think there are other two forms of action. I, I suspect they both need to be really alive, and I have a feeling we maybe go between them ourselves at different stages of our own biography, um, depending on the most urgent needs presenting us. And when you're a parent, the most urgent need is, is probably rightfully right there. Um, the danger for me, having tried different communities for much of my life, if I, if I look at a theme, communities of meaning, is to relax too deeply into, I've got it, I found it. And I think the challenge of always um, questioning complacency, um, especially when we have an inkling that maybe we do, we do got it, uh, that we're onto something, uh, and to still keep the questioning alive especially when you're functioning as an endangered species. Um, so that, it's a tricky dance on a, on a pinhead, I think, to figure out how to rightfully engage to advance this. But again, I would return to the fact that we must because the needs are urgent. I guess I can just say one thing. Thank you, Bindu. Um, for me, it's not one or the other. It's more like this recursive process between reflection and action. And I feel like it came to that over time for, for me, because I feel like when I first sort of discovered, you know, non-Western approaches to you know, spirit and psychology, I was kind of like, it was a spiritual bypass. I was like, oh, I'm gonna just meditate and transcend it all, you know, and just that's that. But then over time I learned what a spiritual bypass was. <laughs> you know, it's it's missing the mark. You don't you know interact with these self inquiry tools and then just kind of escape the rest of it. Uh, so I guess but it still remains part of my inquiry process because I think of myself as, as a collaborator or as an instrument. So it's like I need guidance on what I'm to do. So, so it's just a personal note, I guess. But I did mention it. I feel like that's what distinguishes CIS from all other progressive and alternative models is, is we're founded on 
the belief or the assumption that evolution has the potential, uh, education has the potential to be, you know, um, a locus for the evolution of consciousness. And just to just say one thing about your question, um, shadow integration, acknowledgement and integration on a personal and societal and institutional level. And what is shadow? Well, it's what we avert or ignore or don't know about ourselves or institutions. Oh, is there another question? Let's do this. The uh, panel has talked rather forcefully about the need in education for human connection, and yet there is incredible pressure on financial institutions, including our own, to go online. How do you get human connection and relationship into online learning? <laughs> um, you know, there was a, a great dialogue in Waldorf Teacher Education for a while that he could not learn any of it online. Heated discussion, I remember being in a room and I finally said, has anyone done any online learning? And there was dead silence. So I became the guinea pig to do one of the deeper philosophical courses online. And to my surprise, I found it an engaging, um, connected experience. I think because the group had met in person and done some artistic and interpersonal work to begin with, which is one thing that we are trying to do here. Um, it's not the answer, and it is unfortunately being touted as the answer, as many, many things in education have been touted before. But it is undoubtedly part of our current and future reality. Um, and so again, I think a place like CIIS, as we go bravely or timidly into these fields, have to keep coming back to what do we hold to be essential for the human being, the human dialogue, and the human condition. And do we have a match or not? And I always go back to words that I find reassuring of Rudolf Steiner, who has been my sort of North Star, um, when he founded the first Waldorf School, when he said there will have to be compromises. We need to choose the compromises. It is most urgent that this new art of education is in the world. So I think it's it's like all of these questions. It's, it's not static. Um, and there's a lot in this realm that we don't know yet. And our danger is when we make it the newest, bright, shiny object that will solve everything rather than a tool in our human toolkit. So. It's not my choice of teaching, uh, but it does work. Again, individualizing instruction depending on what you know of the learner, it does work for many students and many teachers. I'm not one of those teachers who prefer that. I, I see the value in the face-to-face, -face. And, and so yes, if I were to teach an on, when I did teach an online course, I needed the face-to-face -face first. But I'll just interject, one thing that really took me back was hearing Margo uh, talk about doing ATB, Awareness Through the Body, online. Have you written the online? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> and I thought, how can that be possible? And I had to be convinced that it does work, but I couldn't imagine. So I think there are some things that are better taught online and things that are better taught face-to-face. -face. I had assumed that ATB would have to be face to face, and I was proven wrong. An open, open mind on what can work and how can it work. Would you wrap up? Yes, I just may have to do with product of my being approaching 60 years old, so I'm kind of already moving um, back towards spirit. We can't hear you. Mm -hmm. We can't hear you. Sorry. This, this, may, this may be a product of my age. I'm, I understand that where my question is coming from. Um, and I was mindful when Sean was speaking yesterday that we've had however many millions of years of human doing. And we just seem to keep making things worse. And the, my understanding of what 
book for the mother and sure of indoor teaching is the surrender, it's the art of surrender. Now, that's going to look different for everybody, and I don't have an answer, so it's not a prescription. But that's what I'm working on. I don't find that it has much cash value. But it's, for me, it has the ultimate value. Um, maybe I'm uh, creating more disabilities for myself as I move out, try to move out into the world, or exist in the world, and yet my heart tells me that this is the path that I have to follow. So, I, there's a question in there somewhere. Um, but it, it has to do with um, the, maybe the tension between doing, which in, in my limited experience uh, on Earth, it seems to be fraught with all kinds of pitfalls. And, and the art, learning the art of surrender, and, and which I do imperfectly at best. Um, and I think maybe that, in some ways, it feels to me like that it bears the same because we are talking about the mother's work um, here. Thank you. <laughs> and Heidi for helping us explore this just what is it what does it look like question and thank you for coming <laughs>